the 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 tubing around this 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 used fuel or spent fuel, uh, the zirconium cladding, will start to heat up, and it starts to oxidize, uh, rust, uh, in other words, and uh, it generates hydrogen. Uh, it, it, it it separates the uh, the hydrogen from the oxygen in water and starts generating hydrogen. And then after it reaches about 800 degrees centigrade because of the enormous heat emanating from this uh, from the radioactive material inside these tubes, the the cladding, the tubing itself, will spontaneously ignite like giant Roman candles. Mm -hmm. And you'll have essentially a catastrophic fire. Uh, a colleague of mine referred to a a pool fire as uh, Chernobyl on steroids. And isn't that what uh, happened at Unit Four or Unit Three in Fukushima? Well, it, it, what has happened? These these it's not there. There is certainly some evidence that it happened at Unit Four and Unit Three. Uh, the what is what has caused the, those huge explosions in the areas of the pools have, have not been fully explained, uh -huh. uh, and they are now sort of we're still still operating in the realm of of uh, what uh, TEPCO is willing to share with the public, or the Japanese government is willing to share with the public. Certainly, right during the course of the accident, our Nuclear Regulatory Commission had concluded that the pool at, at Unit 4 had experienced an explosion yeah. uh, because the fuel had been exposed. Hydrogen but explosion. They, al they also found evidence of, of uh, fragments of fuel uh, that were blown away uh, as far as a mile or so from the reactor. With plutonium in them? Well, yes. Uh, well, they had plutonium in them, but I think that the, the real bad actor in, in a uh, spent fuel uh, uh, fire uh, is cesium-137. Uh, and the reason is that it, it, do it tends to dominate the long-lived radioactive materials that are present. Describe uh, cesium. Tell the people what cesium-137 is, Bob, and, what, and, and its radioactive um, properties and its biological properties. Certainly. Uh, cesium-137 uh, has a half-life of of 30 years, so the rule of thumb is that it takes approximately 10 half lives for it to decay to down to levels that are presumed to, to not be harmful to people. So it can be it can remain dangerous for centuries. Uh, as it decays, it gives off uh, a form of external penetrating radiation, like X-rays, called gamma rays. So if there is a substantial amount of radioactive cesium that's deposited on the ground, you can get your whole body irradiated from these gamma rays. Then over time, uh, cesium mimics potassium and will therefore accumulate in the food chain and will accumulate in all things uh, that, that people consume as food, whether they be uh, vegetables or, or animal products as if it were potassium. And so then that, the, that potassium or a radioactive cesium, once it enters your body, is essentially incorporated throughout your body. And so you're getting uh, internal exposure to your whole body from radioactive cesium. A cesium-137 uh, is the primary reason why they have the exclusionary zone around Chernobyl. Uh, that's approximately uh, uh, a, a thousand square meters, square uh, meters. roughly uh, uh, square kilometers. That's right, correct. Square kilometers. Yes. Square kilometers, and uh, for us in the United States, it's uh, about the size of half of one of our states, New Jersey. Um, so, and that area has has been been off limits now for. Uh, uh, some 25, 26 years, <clears throat> um, and would probably remain so for perhaps hundreds of years. Um, so what's happening? We, we, we pointed out in our study that if there were 
such a fire at a U.S. reactor that contained uh, uh, this, this amount of cesium. These reactors can contain as much as uh, uh, 35 million curies of radioactive cesium in them. If, they, if, the, if um, a fraction of, of that uh, material were to be released in a fire and, and get out through the smoke and deposit on the nearby land, it could render an area uninhabitable much greater than that created by the Chernobyl accident. Of a thousand square kilometers. Right. We pointed out that it could be, depending on how much radioactive cesium would get out, it could be as much as 60 times greater than the uh, uh, than the exclusionary zone at well, uh, Chernobyl. Well, so, so to give people an idea of what that means, what the size of the state of what? Which it would be the size of several states. It several would be states. New, New, New Jersey, uh, Rhode Island, New England, uh, a good part of New England uh, would be rendered uninhabitable. New York, Massachusetts uh, uh, would be rendered uninhabitable. So, all right, let's go from from America. If I can just if I can just finish the story a little yeah, bit. Yes, sorry, further. sorry. This study provoked quite a hue and cry by the nuclear industry of the United States. And we were, uh, uh, let's say, stricken off of a lot of Christmas card lists. <laughs> and, but it, it provoked such controversy that the United States Congress asked the National Academy of Sciences to sort this out. And in 2004, the Academy released a report which essentially confirmed our findings. So then what happened? Uh, uh, it, it was uh, essentially ignored by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. How dare that, they? What What are these characters? What do these characters think they're doing? I mean, the more I look at the nuclear industry, the more I realise what a horrific crime, horrific crime it is. Um, it is putting upon the people of the world, particularly in Japan. Um, I spoke to a man yesterday who is trying to bring a lawsuit against the Japanese government for incinerating sewage and radioactive waste. Um, by incinerating it, all you do is you push it up into the air and then disperse it all over the country. And there's a huge cover-up going on in Japan at the moment, Bob. Um, and I, it almost takes... Well, it does take my breath away. I, 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 it's a crime beyond anything I've really ever ever known. What well, would you say to that statement? I, I'd say that in our country, uh, we, do, we don't have real regulation of nuclear safety. Uh, we have an agency that's more of an enabler. Well, why is, uh, why is that? Why is that? Well, I, I think that, well, in recent years, it has a lot to do with the changing political landscape in the United States. Uh, by the late 1990s, rather, uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had in place, and some can argue that it wasn't good enough, but it was, it was, it was, it was, it was there and it would prove to be somewhat adequate, had a, a much more of an arm's length relationship with the industry it's supposed to regulate. And uh, in the 1990s, a whistleblower at a uh, reactor in Connecticut, the Millstone One reactor, uh, be, who was an employee there, became very concerned about the shortcuts that were being taken by the operators of this reactor, especially how they were handling spent fuel in particular. Eventually, uh, this whistleblower made the, the, the cover of Time magazine, and it so embarrassed the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they had to go in and they did what I would describe as a wire brush inspection and found a host of problems and ordered the reactor to be closed until the problems could be uh, corrected. The owner of the reactor essentially decided that it wasn't worth the money and shut it down. This provoked a huge amount of anger and outcry in the Republicans who were controlling the, the Congress at the time, and uh, they threatened to cut 700 positions from the NRC's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Enforcement Division uh, and more or less forced the NRC to move away from its position of being a regulator 
to being an enabler and made it much more dependent on industry self-reporting of problems. Oh, uh, with, so it was the Republicans, with, really, yeah. who have yeah. little, if any, scientific background or knowledge. Well, if you read the the autobiography of Senator Peter Domenici, oh. the Republican senator from New, from New Mexico, he proudly, in, in, there's, a, there's this passage in his autobiography where he proudly notes that he did this. Uh, he was outraged that uh, somebody concerned about safety would dare shut down a reactor that would, was losing, causing a company to lose money. And he promised that this would never happen again, and he was in such a position of authority that he uh, threatened to essentially gut the entire NRC's enforcement program. I wonder if he's ever seen anyone die of cancer, who he loves. I don't know. I don't know anything about his personal life. Uh, it just uh, so, takes my breath away but, as a doctor. These characters are so evil, and I, I mean, I mean that word. I mean that word as a doctor, evil, because what is happening now in Japan is so horrendous, and there's a huge cover-up by TEPCO and the Japanese government and the American government, may I say, and the media in Japan and America. And there are going to be hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of deaths from cancer from what's happening in Fukushima, let alone what may happen, as you are describing, Bob Alvarez, in America at certain reactors as we proceed. I, I, can't, I can't think of any other word to describe this. Well, it's going to be... It's, this, this accident is continuing to unfold in terms of its consequences. And I, I'm not sure, given the severity of this accident, that that the uh, the efforts to try to downplay its dangers, deny its existence, make its victims as invisible as possible, blame the victims is another thing they do. Mm -hmm. I don't not necessarily I don't necessarily think that those tactics are going to prevail in a situation that's so severe as this. Well, but uh, that, there's no evidence, really. I mean, the average Joe Blow in the street, or Mrs. Joe Blow, hasn't a clue what's going on in Japan. And I would, I've just been in America for an intense four-week lecture tour. People have no idea. In Australia, we, the uranium in those reactors is probably Australian uranium. No one knows. And I just spoke to a very highly qualified person in Japan yesterday, and he said there's a huge cover-up there, too. So, in fact, I do not understand how the ramifications could be so severe if no one knows what's going on and there's a huge cover-up. Well, I think, I think the kinds of things that are going on that don't get re reported much at all mm. is, is the fact is that many of the foods grown in Japan are no, are no longer being allowed in to other countries. Yeah. Uh, this is having a serious impact. Uh, the rice harvest of Japan is now being jeopardized. Yes. And rice is, is a, not only a, a huge staple for the diet, it has, it has very great cultural importance to the Japanese. Um, they are now reporting areas of contamination in greater metropolitan Tokyo that are comparable to <clears throat> what is being found in the, in the exclusionary zone at the uh, Chernobyl. I mean, these are unprecedented problems. I mean, there there isn't anything that 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 compares to the the challenge posed by protecting people from the aftermath of this accident. At Chernobyl, they have, were able to evacuate permanently around 200,000 people, and one of the things they were one of the reasons they were able to do that with some success is that was was the low population density. They, around Chernobyl, they had an average population density of approximately 10 people per square kilometer. Mm. In a place like greater metropolitan Tokyo, your population density is around six to 7,000 people per square kilometer. Mm. Uh, where are these people to go? 30 million people live in Tokyo. 30 million people live in Tokyo. Two million people live in the Fukushima prefecture where half the rice in Japan is grown and the rice is now just starting to be harvested and it's full of cesium-137, which is the... I mean, I think this is something about. that's going...